Welcome back. The question we're all asking ourselves, what constitutes rich in this country? President Obama has been very clear, repeatedly saying, when it comes to determining who gets a tax increase, it's those individuals that make more than $200,000 and those couples that make more than $250,000 together. But Reuters columnist Daniel Indiviglio says rich is $1 million. At that level, he says we can raise plenty of tax revenue and take a big step toward avoiding the fiscal cliff. Indiviglio joins me now, along with New Democrat Network President Simon Rosenberg, who says $250,000 is plenty rich and should be taxed at a higher rate threshold. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure, Daniel, where do, you, where do you get $1 million? Why should $1 million in income be the threshold for what's considered wealthy? Right. So let me start off first by saying it would be great if we lived in a world where we didn't have to raise taxes on anyone, but that's not the world we live in, right? We have $16 trillion of debt, trillion dollar deficits four years in a row. Something has to be done. So the other thing to kind of note is taxing the rich, even at the $250,000 level or more, isn't going to be enough to fix the deficit situation alone. According to calculations I've done, that'll get you somewhere in the ballpark of $380 billion if you let the Bush tax cuts expire for those people over 10 years. So now you have to look at sort of what makes political sense, because this is all about politics. Democrats want to tax people at higher rates if they make more than 250. Republicans don't want to tax anyone at higher rates. So what we need is a compromise, and that compromise, I think, is $1 million. And I, nice but you just said to me, you just said to me that you're really not moving the needle. You're not really getting the right. revenue you need by just taxing the $250,000 group. Right. So you're, gonna, you're getting less revenue then by taxing the million well, dollar group. Exactly. You're getting a little less. But here's the thing. That's the way you get to compromise. And the amount, here's what's nice about the million dollar threshold. You only lose one third of the revenue. You still collect $200, you know, over 10 years, which is, again, not enough, but still a good amount of money. But you eliminate a whole two million people from that group. And instead, you're only taxing 250,000 people. And these are, of course, <laughs> very rich people. If you're making more than a million dollars a year, I don't think anyone would argue that you're not doing pretty well. So right. these are people who can afford it. Simon, can families who have an annual household income of $250,000 but live in high-cost areas like New York, Washington, San Francisco, got significant amounts of the U.S. population uh, living there, and can they be considered rich? Well, I think uh, for the purposes of this discussion, certainly there's serious consideration of raising their taxes. Whether they consider themselves rich or we consider ourselves rich, I think they don't think they are, right? I think we all know that. I'm one of those people, right, living in Washington, and I don't think I'm rich. But I think the important part is some basic data, right? Median income in the United States is $55,000 a year for a family of four. If you make $250,000 a year or more, you're in the top 5% of wage earners in the United States. By any definition, that would be considered to be upper end or maybe even rich, Maria, based yeah, on the I way mean, that you define it. And you so, can say that, but you, you, when you've got a yeah. couple bringing in collectively $250,000, you've got the nanny and you've got the food and you've got yep. the gasoline, you're, you're still living paycheck to paycheck. I doubt I, they feel rich. I understand that, but the thing is, just basic data, we're talking about the upper 5% of, Amer of income earners, and if we're going to do what Daniel said, which is if we're going to make a, de a dent in the deficit, there are three things we got to do, right? Just the basic math works this way. We've got to cut defense, we've got to raise revenues, and we've got to reform Medicare and Medicaid. Those are the three critical things that have to get done if we're going to see a significant uh, deficit reduction deal over the next six months. Here's my question to you both, okay? And this, I'm going to do an observation about this later on in the show, but, but let me ask you this. If we're only attacking the top rate, and, and, and you could call it a million, you could call it 250000 If we're only attacking the top rate, and that's going from 35% where it is right now to close to 10, which is where it's going to go at the end of the year if they do nothing about the fiscal cliff, who's to say that those people who are able to manipulate or, you know, account for that, the revenue, account for their earnings as capital gains versus ordinary income, so they're paying a much lower tax rate, 15%, and, and the president always says, pay your fair share. Uh, who's to say they're not going to still do the same thing? I mean, they're still going to account. So whether they're, making for, whether they're accounting for 40% in terms of taxes or 35%, they're still going to account for it as, as capital gains and not income. So what did we do? We didn't do anything. Well, I, I think that, that, I mean, that's exactly sort of the point in that, is that you're not going to see a drastic change here if you're taxing millionaires. But, but from the political calculus, right, we're going to have other revenue measures. You know, maybe we're going to have corporate taxes, you know, loopholes closed or something. You're gonna it's have it's the loopholes and exemptions. It's the ability to account your ordinary income as if it were capital gains. 
If they're not going to take away, you know, loopholes and exemptions, taking taxes to 100 percent is still not going to do anything because those people are still going to be able to account for their ordinary income as if it was capital gains. That's my point. Right. I think you need that too. Right. I agree. Well, Maria, it's an important point because if you if you think about what President Obama talked about with the Buffett rule, where you know that we've seen now such a different in tax treatment between. Uh, uh, investment income and, and earning, earned income, everyday average income for workers, it's gotten so, uh, the, the gap has gotten so big that I think the tax system's become unfair and he's talked about closing that. I don't know how, look, I think we're going to see two steps in this process. I think we're going to see some easy things done quickly and then there's going to be a much broader effort to try to really tackle the deficit over time. I don't think that's going to happen in the next two or three months, but over the next six to nine months, let's hope there's something really significant done to tackle the deficit over time, but those three things have got to be on the table. More right. revenue, Medicare, defense, well, we're not going to make much of a difference. We, we, can't, we can't leave this Congress naming the 40%, uh, some people say 49% of the people who pay no income tax. Should they pay something? Well, it's complicated. I mean, they, they, you know, it's a lot of them do pay something with sales tax or, you know, state taxes. But I, I, I do think it's great if we have a system where everyone pays, you know, a little bit more or something. But it, we also have to balance that with the current economic situation, right? I mean, right now is not the best time to, you know, put new taxes into effect when the economy is barely growing. So. Simon, what about you? Should, should those people pay something, even if it's a small number, just so that everybody has a stake in the ground? Those people are paying federal taxes. I mean, I think this is, we got to be well, careful here. Income tax, so, so I understand that, but 70% of people who pay tax in the United States pay more in payroll tax than they do in income tax. And I think these people are paying into the system. They're just not paying through the income tax. We also know that wealthy people are not paying enough of their income, as you said earlier, because they get the 15% capital gains tax. Well, so not all there's wealthy gonna be, people. There's not gonna all be, wealthy people. No, no, That's but there's a going to be. Statement. Right, no, no, but people who get their money through investment income are paying a much lower rate. So we have to tackle that as well as perhaps broadening the base. But remember, we're talking about very poor people, Maria. I mean, these are people making twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a year. You know, raising their tax by a little right. bit isn't going to net that much income, and they are paying federal taxes. This is not—it's not unfair to say they're not paying federal tax. They're just not paying that tax. Think there? Think there? Anybody in that group is skirting the system, putting themselves under the poverty level, or maybe they're really not. I, I, sure. I think if we're looking for that place to get revenue, I think we're looking in the wrong the Absolutely, wrong Absolutely, but I'm just saying we're only looking at the million-dollar group. We're not going to move the needle there either. Just putting everything on the table. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay. We'll sure. see you soon. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. Forget Black Friday. We're going to look at... Uh,